Greetings, Morningstar Missionary Baptist Church. I'm so delighted to be able to come and stand before you once again. Uh, thank God for this medium and this way of us still being able to communicate, to get the word out, to still be able to hear the preached word of God, to still receive of his blessings. I want to ask that you would continue to pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ, especially for the members here of Morningstar Missionary Baptist Church, as well as our extended families. Amen. Deacon Kelly is still improving. We thank God for that. We want to ask that you would continue to pray for him and for Deaconess Kelly. I know it's difficult for her because she's not able to be there with him at the hospital. So please continue to pray for her as well. Also, I want to ask you to pray for all members of Morningstar Missionary Baptist Church. The coronavirus has touched us here at Morningstar and so we want to pray just for all families, amen. And uh, God willing, we'll come out of all of this all right. My brothers and sisters, I wanna to get to the task at hand that is before us today. So if you will, turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, the fourth chapter. We're gonna read quite a few verses today. Uh, I want to read it all because I'm not gonna preach Verse by verse by verse by verse, it's way too much. I'd be here too long, my voice would be gone. Amen. So uh, I'm going to be touching on some things in there, pulling something out in particular as it deals with our theme of this year on depression that I've been preaching at the 8 o'clock hour. I'm going to be preaching on depression today. So um, join, join me, if you will, in the Gospel of John, the fourth chapter. We're going to begin reading at verse number one. And the Bible reads this way, reading from the King James Version. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sukkar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto him, to her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidst thou truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, 
for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. As I said, I want to speak on the theme of depression, which I've been doing during our 8 o'clock services before the pandemic hit. And for a topic today, I want to talk about failure and shame. Failure and shame. We are familiar with the story of the woman of Samaria. How she came to the well to draw water and met Jesus there, not knowing at first who he was. She conversed with him as one who had no knowledge of her past. But as he revealed himself to her, she perceived that he was a prophet. For he knew things about her that a stranger should not know. She ends up leaving her water pot and going to tell the men of Samaria, as the Bible says in John chapter 4, verse 29, come see a man which told me all things ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Once again, this woman captures our attention, only this time it is not about her leaving her empty water pot. No, we look at her for another insight that we might better understand ourselves. Have you ever failed at anything in your life? Have you ever been ashamed of anything that you have done? Yes, is the obvious answer. Yes, we've all failed at some time or another. Yes, we've all done things that we are ashamed of. And though many long to forget their failures and their shame, God can yet use those things to help us on our journey. This woman of Samaria came in the hottest part of the day to draw water. Others would come in the cool of the morning or in the cool of the late evening, but she came in the hottest part of the day. Perhaps she didn't like to wait in long lines for her turn to draw water, but no, that was not the reason why. She came in the heat of the day to avoid encountering any other people. Now, why would she do that, we would ask the question. Well, because of the way that other people looked at her, whispered about her, deliberately turned their backs toward her. Why would they treat her this way? Because her reputation preceded her. The people of Samaria had already labeled her tramp, loose woman, a woman of the streets, or maybe even a husband stealer. She had failed to be like other women. She associated more with the men of Samaria than she did with the women of Samaria. They despised her for what she was, and she was so ashamed she avoided other people who would constantly remind her of her failures in life. She preferred to be alone. 
and to deal with her dilemma alone, depressed and ashamed. The first thing I want to lift out of our text today is this question in only three words, by whose standard? Depression, my brothers and sisters, runs hand in hand with low self-worth. And we as humans evaluate self-worth. You might say, well, not all the time. Yes, we do. We do it and we do it all the time. We make judgments about people. The music they listen to. The hairstyle they wear, the clothes that they wear, the way that they walk and the way that they talk. Are they left-handed or right-handed? Even the shape of their head, how their eyes are positioned. Do they talk with a lisp? How short are they? How tall are they? We even talk about the size of their feet. You're beginning to get the picture the problem is that when people do that, the, the, the one they do it to begins to learn that he or she doesn't measure up. So the question is, whose standard is it? It varies, but the emotional consequences are still the same. It doesn't matter if it's parental, cultural, social, or even if it's God's unwavering commandments. Whatever the standard is, we have failed. That's what we hear when people talk about us. And the word gets back to us. What they have said about us. Today's rebellious attitude wants to reject all standards imposed on them and reject any that are imposed by anybody. And even as far as God's commandment, folk don't worry no more because no one measures up to God's commandment. Romans 3 and 23 reassures us for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No, no one measures up to the commandments of God. So today's generation wants to say to God, why try? Everybody fails with God. Children look at their parents and evaluate them and they see nothing but failure even in their parents. And we think, we think our solution wherein we reassess ourselves with standards that are less oppressive and more fair to us are better for us. Now, when we lower the bar, we begin to esteem ourselves better than others. And we don't even realize that we're repeating the problem all over again. But there is a deeper problem, my brothers and sisters, that must be exposed. Let us reorient ourselves by recalling the nature of the human heart. The human heart is always choosing. This woman in her heart chose to go to the well, listen, at a time of minimal encounter. Just so she would not have to suffer the failure to meet the standards of the others who might be there at the well. Just so she would not have to deal with the shame of not being as good as everyone else who might be there at the well. Here's the question, my brothers and sisters. Since when has anyone other than Jesus been the standard? And 
Why have we accepted this alternative standard as the one that we must meet? Those questions lead me to my second point. Let me say something about making people our gods. The woman at the well asked Jesus this question. Verse 12, art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Regardless of who this man is, the woman compares him to the well's accepted greatness of Jacob. Jacob's greatness, according to the text, came from their belief that Jacob gave them this well, drinking thereof himself, his family, and even his cattle. It sustained them and it's still sustaining those who come after him. My brothers and sisters, tucked away behind that statement is the personal belief that the well sustained Jacob and his family and that the well even caused them to prosper. If we were to follow this incorrect line of thought, it would lead us to a place where we too would believe we are blessed if we possess the well and if we drank from the well. The well, while a blessing to the Samaritans of that day, was not the source of their blessing. James chapter 1 verse 17 from the New International Version says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. One could argue, Scripture shows that we come from a long line <laughs> of idolaters. Yeah, idolatry is written throughout the Bible. As preachers say, from kiva to kiva. From Genesis to Revelation, you're going to find idolatry. It runs like a thread through the Bible. And two of our topmost favorite idols have been money and people. Two of the top most. I didn't say the top most, but two of the top most. Money and people. Why do people even choose idols? Because we believe that they can satisfy our needs and our wants. People want admiration. People want respect. They want honor, influence, kindness, and perhaps most of all, people want love. So we live our lives based upon other people's expectations, other people's opinions, and sometimes, yes, even other people's standards. Our goal being to receive what we want, all because we believe that if we give them what they want, then they will give us what we want. <laughs> but at what cost? You will have to become like them. You will have to cater to them, change so that you fit in with them. And the list goes on. And suddenly you will be serving them as if they are your God. And to keep you serving them, they will never let you measure up to their standard. Understand, my brothers and sisters, that people will never satisfy you. And you will end up becoming of servant of whatever 
you put your trust in. Romans 6 chapter 16 says, don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. This woman trusted in her own cunning to keep herself from being ridiculed. She trusted in avoidance to get rid of her shame. But the moment she encountered someone again, she would be reminded of her failure and the shame would still be there. We know folk, perhaps even we look in the mirror at ourselves, that have tried to deal with shame by avoidance. No, I'm not going over there. <laughs> I, I, because in my heart, I know I did something, and, and I know they know over there that if they see me, they're going to look at me and start reading the labels that they placed on me. So no, I'm going to avoid going over there. Avoidance will never help you to deal with your dilemma. My brothers and sisters, what we really need to do is my final point. I want to talk about toppling our idols. Anytime we trust in anything else other than God, it becomes a sin on us. And God calls it idolatry. If we avoid others because of our failures and our shame, yes, even that is a sin. And it's a sin on our part. How is that? Because we cannot fulfill the mandate of Christ. Remember what the Bible says? We are his ambassadors carrying his word of reconciliation. How can I take the word and carry it to give to someone else when I'm so busy trying to avoid encountering them? Yes, it's a sin. Understand, my brothers and sisters, that it is the Holy Spirit that convicts us of sin. This is something we've got to really learn and get right. Not man. We get mad at someone just for pointing out sin in our lives. You, you, you've heard this expression. You, you, you go to your brother, your sister, and you let them know that what they did was wrong, and they snap back so quick. You better stop judging me. Don't you judge me. You can't judge me. I know some dirt on you. And they start to hurl the insults. Y'all, that's shame speaking. Because that's what shame sounds like. Shame barks at you. Shame attacks you. Shame because we don't like to feel shame. Go all the way back. It's shame is threaded throughout the Bible as well. In Genesis, when God came in the cool of the day, after they had eaten the fruit, shame made them hide themselves from God. Shame made them. Place blame on others. We are affected by our failures and by our shame. But did you not know, my brothers and sisters, that one of the blessings of seeing sin is so that we can actually do something about it? When we find sin in our lives, we can ask God for mercy and for forgiveness so that we can change. What I'm trying to tell you is we have been given the Holy Spirit so that we no longer have to be slaves to sin. There is a way out of the 
depression of failure and shame. In the Bible, idols were often sculptures that were made out of stone or out of wood. And in repentance, they were torn down, broken, and or burned. This Samaritan woman shows us how to deal with our dilemma. You ready? Come with me for a moment. Remember, she started out saying to Jesus there in verse 9, How is it that thou being a Jew asketh drink of me, which am a Samaritan, a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with The Samaritans. This statement in her mind was to remind this Jewish man that he should remember that they, the Jews, despise who she represents, the Samaritans. She was saying that there has always been separation and that she is more comfortable with the separation than with their conversation. But this was no ordinary Jewish man. This was Jesus. And to topple her idols, he had to expose to her how she belittled herself from her failures and for her shame. Because for as long as she thought He did not know her failure and her shame. She was willing to converse with him. But when he called her out about her husband's situation, exposing that she had had five and has one now that is not hers, she immediately became reacquainted with her failure and with her shame. But Jesus did not belittle her for it. Listen. Instead, Jesus freed her from it. How, you might ask? I'm glad you asked. He complimented her for her worship. Stop right there. This woman suffering from depression, this woman who had failed that we know of according to the Bible six times, this woman whose shame preceded wherever she went, this woman still went and worshipped? Why would that shock us? Why would that seem inappropriate to us? Did God ever tell us that we are too unworthy to come into his house? She still went to worship. You come to worship. God knows what you've been doing throughout the week, yet you still come in to worship. We dress nice so that we look nice and we look like everybody else but guess what God ain't impressed by the clothes that we wear he's looking at our heart he complimented her for her worship which she had continued to do see we quit she continued he expounded upon her worship to no longer focus on the mountain as the place but rather to focus instead in the act of worship, to worship in spirit and in truth. He is telling us to no longer hide behind our sins, but to confess them in truth and to repent of them, not alone by ourselves, but with his help. To which the woman responds, I have heard (laughs) that one called the Messiah, which is called Christ, is coming. Now, Jesus fulfills her deliverance by saying, if I may impart a little bit of myself, woman, I that speak unto thee am he. Now she is free. Failure? What failure? He has taken it away. Shame? What shame? He has taken it 
away. That's what Jesus does. He doesn't rub it in our face. He takes it away. Let me close with a story. <laughs> in the book entitled A Forgiving God in an Unforgiving World, it's the true story that is told of a priest in the Philippines. A much-loved man of God who carried the burden of a secret sin which he had committed many years before. He had repented, but still had no peace, no sense of God's forgiveness. In his parish was a woman who deeply loved God and who claimed to have seen visions in which she spoke to Christ and he with her. The priest, however, was skeptical, so he decided he was going to test her. And to test her, he said, the next time you speak with Christ, I want you to ask him what sin your priest committed while he was in seminary. The woman agreed. A few days later, the priest asked, well, did Christ visit you in your dreams? Yes, he did, she replied. And did you ask him what sin I committed in seminary? Yes, she said. Well, what did he say? This is her remark. He said, I don't remember. Oh, my brothers and sisters. <laughs> See, Christ deals with our failures and our shame and he deals with it in a way that is unlike the way that the world deals with it you see Christ takes it away the world will rub it in your face but Christ takes it away if the son therefore shall make you free you are free indeed stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. God has set us free from sin, from the penalty of sin, and from the power of sin. And he did it at Calvary, where Jesus gave his life. But the thing you got to remember is when he rose, he said, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. And Jesus, having all power, doesn't use it for himself, but for the glory of his Father. There may be someone here, having watched this, hearing the message for this day. You want to accept Christ. You want to be saved. The Bible is very clear in what we must do. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's all that is required. So if you want to be saved, bow your head and pray this prayer with me. Father in heaven, we come to you right now bringing to you more of your lost sheep. I and one of the lost sheep. Father, I repent of my sins. I have not kept your commandments. I have instead transgressed. Oh Lord, let me now be redeemed by the blood which Jesus shed for me at Calvary, I confess Jesus Christ is my Lord, and I believe that he has risen from the dead and is seated on the right hand of the Father, where he makes intercession for me day and night. Let me receive your Holy Spirit 
And let him delight to dwell in me. Let him order my steps in your word. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Morning Star. I hope that you are remaining blessed. Please continue to pray for your church family, especially for our deacons and deaconess, and for the Hinton family. I uh, failed to mention at the start, but they suffered death in the family on Sister Hinton's side of the family. An uncle of hers who's a preacher passed away. Please keep the Hintons lifted in your prayers. Continue to pray for the McCoys, the Bakers, Chavises. I know I'm naming the deacons, but y'all need to know who really needs prayer. All deacons and deaconess, pray for them all. We thank God for how he is holding this church together. Don't forget, as a reminder, to pay your tithes. You can do so online on our church website. If you're not a member, you can still give an offering to this church. Go to our website, msmbcd.com. Click on the Give menu item, and you can follow the directions uh, for Donate, and it'll tell you what to do and walk you through everything. You can do it through PayPal, with a debit card, or with a credit card, whatever is your leisure. Whew. I want to ask you that you continue to pray for me and my family. Thank God we're all doing as well as we are. Pray for this country. Pray for our leaders. We're supposed to pray for our leadership. And uh, at all times, y'all pay attention to what's going on. Hopefully soon we'll be able to meet again. It will not be when they immediately say churches can have worship again. We're going to have our own plan for reopening Morning Star because we do not want to suffer an outbreak in this place. Amen, church. Amen. I know some will say, well, I ain't coming back until that's fine. Our hope and our prayer is to be able to continue to do this. The sermons will be recorded and put out there on YouTube, but also to broadcast our Bible study sessions live, just as we have been doing. And those that want to come out will be able to come out. Those that don't, stay at home, but still you'll be able to partake. Those that are far away, watch and partake. It's all all right. Just continue to pray for us in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. God bless your hearts, and I hope to see you all again soon. I really do miss everybody of Morning Star. Amen. God bless you.